And hello, darlings. Hello, hello. Here I am. Here, let me just put this in, make sure this is coming through on the microphone. Hello. Am I here? Am I there? We got the volume. Where's the volume? I have no idea. Ah, well. Seems to be working, but feel free to tell me if it's not. Um, if any of you cannot hear me, um, go ahead and post something now. Otherwise, I will assume that you can. So it's hard to tell with that. Um, anyway, so I'm mainly here just because I missed y'all and wanted to check in. And um, it's been four weeks. It's been a absolutely crazy last month. Um, I enjoyed the sabbatical. I can't swear it won't go on because I have to still plan what I'm going to do and I'll inform you about that as I go. Um, good. Okay. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm on. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. Um, it's been so long since I've done this. I had to redo everything from scratch, um, including resetting the lights and stuff. So I feel like I'm slightly different color than I usually am, but maybe that's just me. I don't know. Anyway, very good to see you all. Um, what's been going on on this end? Well, it's utter craziness for a variety of reasons, many of which um, are just domestic things and I won't bore you with. We're trying, Deb and I are trying to figure out what we're doing, whether we're going to stay in this house, whether we're going to move somewhere else. We, our kids are in the process of moving out. We're basically halfway through that process. Um, this, this summer, we've got two of our four young people um, moving out um, to attend college and other things. And uh, we've given the other two <laughs> a, a deadline. And then at that point, we have to figure out what we're going to do. So that's taken up a lot of energy. Of course, I'm still deeply, deeply in uh, Navigator's Children, which I will explain about in a moment as well. Um, and just dealing with, you know, life, life in all of its uh, multivalent, uh, shimmering evanescence, um, which means we spend a lot of time going, what? Um, <laughs> so no complaints. I'm feeling generally fairly well. Um, certainly compared to the last time some of you, well, the, you know, the few weeks or month before um, the last time I, I did a reading um, where I was going through a lot of joint issues, which I'm still having some of them, but it's much better. You'll notice I'm not wearing um, wrist braces tonight. So before I start anything, um, why don't I just zip through and say hello to everybody, and then I'll just start babbling about various things. So first off, it's Holger. Good to see you, Holger. Um, and I can't promise you I'll make it a whole hour tonight, but I might. I might. It doesn't matter. Um, but I'm definitely here because I miss you all and, and uh, would hate to get everybody, let everybody get completely out of the habit of checking in with me because I like to have people check in with me, and I like to check in with people. So Holger, good to see you. Ronnie, a pleasure. Good to see you too. Petra, hello, hello. Nice to see you too. Jeremy, I know you're doing Bacon. I'm sorry I can't make Bacon. We're in the middle of a crazy weekend, but I hope you have a great time and I hope you get lots of people for your your paneling and uh, you receive the, the, uh, the due which your diligence is owed. So anyway, good to see you, Jeremy. And and again, apologies for not being at Baycon. It's a crazy weekend. I'm not even giving you guys most of the details. So just a lot going on. Debbie, hello. Good morning to you. Thank you for joining me. And there's my mother-in-law, my dear mother-in-law, Hazel. Hello, sweetie. Good morning. Good to see you. Long time no see. I know. I've been playing hooky from my, my broadcast, but here I am. I have returned. Christina, hello, hello. Good to see you too. I'm I'm doing well. I hope you're all doing well. Wouter, Wouter is here. Bonjour from the auto route in France. Um, um, and Iris is doing the typing. Well, that's that's good because it's not a good idea to type when you're driving. I I, I learned that a long time ago. Um, because I used to try to do it with my portable typewriter. And if you think it's hard typing and um, driving with a cell phone, you should try it with an actual typewriter in your lap. Really a bad idea. And I don't know why I was doing it because it's not like anybody was going to get the message until I got home and put it in an envelope and sent it. Anyway, James. Hello, James. Good to see you. 
Mark, a pleasure as always. Kristen, good to see you too. Andre, hello, hello. I'm glad you're here with us. Um, and uh, good. I'm glad you're looking forward to Bruder des Windes. Um, Bruder des Windes. Um, and uh, I hope you enjoy it. Cliff, hello, hello. And you're doing bacon also. Um, yeah, I know. I'm sorry I'm not there. I, I try to make bacons. I really do. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, Cliff and Jeremy are talking about a local convention that takes place here in the Bay Area and has for many, 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 many years. I mean, like before I was even in the field. So we're talking now functionally ancient. Um, but I couldn't, I couldn't make it this weekend because of various complications and things going on and exploding plumbing and you name it, it's been happening here. Um, but anyway, I'll, I'll give you a quick update on some of that once I finish saying hello to people. Hello, Aaron. Good to see you. Saul. Hello. Hello. Good to see you too. Chris. Hello. Hello. A pleasure to have you. And thank you once again for all of your work putting um, these up online. And um, it's, it's always hilarious to me because I watch a lot of Facebook on my television. It's one thing I do at night when I'm kind of overstressed is I'll just watch videos, um, all different kinds, a lot of history, science, but also just silly stuff about comics and science fiction and movies and things. And, and it, you know, Facebook always gives you, um, you know, a whole array of different possibilities and every now and then it'll give me an entire row of my own broadcasts and I have to look at all these freeze frame pictures of my face going or you know <laughs> it's it's very disconcerting that's all I can say anyway um La, 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 la. Yes, my mother-in-law is on air, and absolutely, and sometimes also various other family members, including my sister-in-law, check in as well, um, and sometimes my English niece. So, yes, it's a whole family affair, like the old wonderful Sly Stone song. Um, mum, 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 who else have I said? Justin, hello, good to see you, and I'm glad to have you with me. So, yeah, it's been... Um, it's been a crazy last few weeks because of the fact that we're trying to figure out what we're doing with the house. It's even more poignant when things keep blowing up <laughs> and basically all of our plumbing went all at the same time. And then the people, the plumbers started coming in and couldn't figure it out. And, you know, I mean, it just went on for days and days and days. And in the middle of that, our, our, uh, Two of our young people were on their way off to Northern California. We are considered Northern California here in the Bay Area, but really we're right smack dab in the middle of the state, except on the far coast, on the West Coast. Um, but they're going to like actual Northern, Northern California. So they're off doing that this weekend. So I'm snake sitting on top of other things. And and it's crazy. And And of course, as I mentioned, as I teased as we say in the entertainment biz um johnny big dog johnny has made an absolute practice in the last week uh or two weeks of getting out and johnny is kind of persona non grata around the neighborhood for various reasons not because he's a bad dog but because he has no respect for other people's properties and he just goes running around and he gets other people's dogs barking and this is when he gets out we we do our best not to let him get out in fact we built a huge fence across the middle of our rather large area that we live in um we had to build a huge fence just to make it harder for you know to, to keep johnny on the property for various reasons that are again too boring and complicated to explain we had to build this fence so back a few weeks ago maybe a little longer ago than that the last time we had a rainstorm a huge tree uh, up on the hillside fell down and took out a big section of fence and um we didn't know about that until Johnny started escaping and you know every time he escapes it's also the the one of the times back in the old days before we built the fence uh, he escaped and got hit by a car and um, he was very fortunate to get away from it with just a few small injuries um, and as a result although it doesn't stop him from escaping and running out into this self same street but when he's on a leash with us he hates walking down the street he hates walking on the street where he got hit by a car, even when we're with him and he's on a leash, but he's perfectly okay with escaping again and running across the same street. Don't ask me. 
he's a dog. Um, but uh, anyway, so we've been going through this tortuous process. It's it's like almost impossible at the moment to get anybody out to do any, you know, fence repairs because they don't want to come out unless it's a big job. And it's not that big a job. I mean, it'd be several hundreds of dollars probably, but it's not worth it to them to bring a crew out. So I've been trying to do repairs myself with help from various other young people in the household. And every time I would get something done or somebody else would do some variant of it, Johnny now is fascinated by this part of the fence and would go back and worry at it until he found a way to get through whatever repair had been done. And then once I finally got that done, he found another spot near it up at the top where earth movement, you know, or subsidence or whatever had buckled another part of not the wooden fence that we built, but the metal fence that runs along the top of the property. And so he found a corner where he could get out of that. And so every time I turned around, I would be sitting in my office here, which is on the downstairs part of the house. And, and you can't see them, but there's in front of me, there's a bank of glass doors and glass windows, which is one of the nicest things about being here. And um, so outside I can see the yard. But the dog is never supposed to be in that part of the yard because fence, you know, et cetera. And so I have repeatedly had the experience in the last several weeks of like looking up and seeing Johnny sauntering past the door on his way to the street and, you know, across the street and up and down the street and up and around the hill and onto other people's properties. And although in most cases, big dog Johnny is absolutely freaked out with the prospect of doing anything wrong. He's really, he's very sweet and kind of touching that way. He really doesn't ever want to do anything bad most of the time, you know, and if he even thinks you're going to, we don't scold him. We, that we, we would never scold him because he's so worried about things like that. Um, the only time that he completely stops caring about that is when he's out of the house. So if I like go out the door and say, Johnny, he immediately gets this startled look on his face and just bolts, just boom, head straight off the property. And, um, you know, then of course that is followed by half an hour, 45 minutes of me walking up and down the hill, whistling and calling for him occasionally, the rest of the family coming out too. Meanwhile, we're terrified that the neighbors are going to hear us and know that Johnny has gotten out again. We've already had one complaint from some neighbors we don't get along with too well, where they sent the, uh, you know, the animal patrol people out to scold us. Um, and I'm, you know, I, I'm freaked out about that. I like to get along with my neighbors. I don't want, you know, somebody to come and take Johnny away. <laughs> Poor thing. Um, he can't help himself. You know, he's, he's, he's just a little bit manic about the whole thing of when he gets out. So, that's been going on all the last several weeks. And, and I think I've finally gotten it to a point where I've, here's a good old fashioned Silicon Valley, or actually it's older than Silicon Valley, a good tech engineering expression. I've kludged together a fence solution, which I hope will serve until I can actually either hire someone to properly repair that whole section of fence, or I have the copious free time it will take me to do it myself. I don't know about you folks, but I have a list, um, mostly mental, but it's like 70, 80 items long of things that need to be done around the house and, you know, with our, our lives, <laughs> you know, you know, things that DMV stuff and this stuff and door latches that have to be fixed and locks that don't work properly. And, you know, things that need to be taken out of the garage and, and, you know, brought back into the house and plugged in again and et cetera, et cetera. Um, I've just got a huge list of stuff like that to do. And, and so the fence is, is one of them along with a zillion other things and somewhere in the midst of all this, and I'm leaving out all the other stuff, like helping our kids move out and on and on. And on um, I'm supposed to actually get some work done every now and then. Um, which is uh, problematic, but I am working. I swear to God, I am. Um, anyway, uh, I see several other people have checked in. There's Jessica. Hello, Jessica. Good to see you. And oh, look, it's Ivan, my old friend, Ivan. 
Ivan is my dear friend since back in the 70s. And uh, Ivan and I actually briefly played in our in a band together. And Ivan has had a wonderful and exciting life. And um, uh, it's a pleasure to see you here, Ivan. Good, good to see you. Anyway, um, so we have many, many, many things like that going on. And... It's been just totally crazy. So I've actually been valued. Not That's not why I took the time off. I took the time off because I finished the book and I'm still trying to decide how I'm going to approach this. Again, it's not, the, not a question of me not having things to do or say. It's um, purely a question of me finding time to put something together properly. I don't want to just keep on reading my own work for one thing. You know, it, it becomes kind of a long slog to, to you know, read these multi-volume things. I don't know why anybody reads them. Um, no, I don't, don't, please, please keep reading them. I'm just kidding. Um, but, you know, it, I, I really very much would like to do something more specific, um, informational. Like, I think one of the things I'd like to talk about is world building and um, making it interesting to people who've actually read my work by talking not just about the general issues of world building, but about specific things that I've done and choices that I've made and why and how they came about, you know, because there's kind of questions I get all the time, you know, how do you name characters? I get these, you know, both from people who are writers or becoming writers themselves or want to be writers and, you know, also people who just can't believe I spend all day sitting around making things up and have managed to eke out a living doing so for many years. So that's my kind of general idea, and that's what I would like to do. Oh, ah, I almost forgot. Um, she's not here tonight, but my dear friend Ilva, who has done so much work along with uh, another dear friend, Ron, um, and Jeremy, who's here, by the way, and Angela, but, but uh, Ilva, who is in Kassel, Germany, um, is going through a health issue right at the moment. And I'm, I'm worried about her. And I know many of you know her from here online. And so please send your thoughts to Ilva, um, hoping for her to return to health quickly. And so that's that. I've been meaning to, I've been meaning all day to make sure and say that. So I want to say that now before I get off onto another one of my tangents. Um, and completely forget about it. So Ilva, dear, I'm thinking about you. We're all thinking about you here. And we want you to get better really, really soon. And we are, we are beaming our very best good health thoughts to you. Just beaming them. So where was I? Ah, so, um, and I know many of you are, have expressed interest in some of the world building questions and, you know, just general writer questions. But I think also I would like to maybe concentrate on some of the specifics of the things that I've actually done so that people who know, know the work already can say, um, you know, oh, okay. I always wondered about why that or how that was chosen. And um, cause a lot of the things I'm one of the more, conscious writers that you will probably meet um, in the sense that not that <clears throat> not that a lot of the stuff that I do doesn't come out of my subconscious in, in some shape or form. Of course it does. That's kind of the nature of writing, especially writing fiction, you know, is that stuff, tropes, themes, you know, obsessions, they kind of bubble up from below. Um, but and, and in fact, I think to a large extent, fiction has to be fed by that in the same way that, you know, that some people posit that life on Earth may have started by anaerobic bacteria clinging to undersea vents where where steam and chemicals are pushed up from, um, you know, from the molten center of the Earth and eventually work their way up to the top. And that was one of the first discoveries of, of, you know, creatures coming to, you know, the life beginning in places that seem absolutely inhospitable to life. But again, back off the tangent, 
I think in many ways, fiction uh, is, is, is like that as well, in the sense that it's happening down there in the dark, and it's not necessarily obvious um, that, but, but it's there, and it's the energy that comes from that that allows things to start happening. Um, and just as energy is necessary for life, I believe that subconscious energy, whether it be fascination with something or fear of something or, you know, simply things that made a huge impression on the, the forming consciousness, um, I think are oftentimes, you know, really what, what fuels the creation of fictional worlds. And I'm not just talking about fantasy and science fiction. I'm talking about everything you know i'm talking about jane austen and charles dickens and mike mickey spillane's mike hammer you know i mean whatever it is that people are creating i think comes from that that well of subconscious need to deal with things um but anyway so i'd like to talk about that there's a lot of stuff about that that i could that i could build some shows around and would be very happy to do so. So that's what I'm leaning toward, but I also have to prepare it a little bit. Otherwise I'm just talking off the top of my head. And while I can certainly do that, it's not really what I would choose given my druthers. Anyway, what I am going to do tonight and tomorrow when I do the 7 p.m. reading is I am going to read something just because I don't want to jolt people too much. Um, and what I thought I'd read actually, and this will be one of the first times I've done this, um, is I'm going to read from the book that is not out yet, but is on its way. Aha! Oh, I've got it. That's right. I've got it on mirror. Um, anyway, actually, we can change that. Let's change that. That might be fun. Dun, 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 dun. And bingo! All right. Isn't that cool? Okay, so book into the narrow dark and um i think i'm going to read a little bit from that tonight um not enough to give anything super important away so it'll be an early bit of um of the book uh, i always have this problem anyway which is that you know you're being asked to do excerpts for various things whether it be convention uh, magazine, you know, convention booklets, or, you know, the publishers want stuff to send out to the sales force or whatever. And there's always this thing of like, well, geez, they want something exciting, but they, you know, how can I give them anything exciting that doesn't give something away that I don't want given away? You know, and the only real solution is to find something early in the book that, you know, that as soon as the person gets the new book, whether they get it at the library or the bookstore or wherever, um, or download it, at least then, you know, yes, they've already heard it before, but it's not spoiling anything. And it, it you know, it hasn't given anything away because you're going to read it right away. So that's what I'm leaning toward. Here is the, uh, the book. This is the American edition, the DAW edition. As you can see, of course, we have changed the look. And although I've explained this online, um, and I think I explained it on a, on a reading, I will explain it again, which is simply that things changed. And for various reasons that I won't go into because it's not really mine to go into, um, we couldn't, couldn't use Michael's paintings um, for this, it, nothing, nothing to do with Michael um, or any uh, bad will on his part, I hasten to say. Um, and I love Michael's work. So it was nothing to do with us saying, oh, we're not going to use Michael's pictures anymore. Um, it was more to do with business stuff. So um, anyway, so we had did change the look and we used the same look that went with um the uh brothers of the wind cat your timing is terrible okay so anyway so i am going to read a bit i i will see how long it lasts um this is a bit from the it's i'm skipping over 
the uh, forward, so called, um, because that's already appeared um, various places, and I think people can get a hold of it. Um, and uh, oh, look, new people! How nice. Good to see you. Thank you for joining me. Um, I'm just about to read. I love Mr. Whalen's art too. I honestly do. I some of his paintings are still absolute favorites of mine. I've been very lucky with a lot of the covers that he's done for my stuff. Um, anyway, so I'm going to read a little bit from uh, the new book that's coming out this month, if it hasn't come out already. Um, it depends on where you are. And as I said, I'm skipping over the forward and I'm going right to the beginning after that. Part one, time of gathering. So I will read. So anyway, so this is the you know, the little part header thing. Time of gathering. The substance of an arrow is wood, but the arrow's spirit is air. Is that why, when the wind makes the forest trees shake and murmur, I am struck to the heart? And it's credited to Benaya of Kemantari, who is a famous Sithi poet. Chapter one, The Keen Edge. They crouch together in deep darkness, his captor's chill, firm hand pressing the knife against Morgan's throat. Each time quiet footsteps passed their hiding place, his heart raced. Um, just to remind you before I get too far into this, for those of you who either haven't read Empire of Grass or can't remember it very well, at the end of Empire of Grass, um, Dai Chikiza, where Morgan and Tanahaya were, um, has had been essentially attacked and raided by Norn soldiers. Um, the sacrifice soldiers of the Norns, or the Hikidaya, as they are called. And so um, Morgan, in an attempt to escape from these searching Norn soldiers, um, found himself down deep in the lower parts of the city and was taken captive by what turned out to be um, a Hikidaya, a female Hikidaya or female Norn. And that's what this is about here. They crouched together in deep darkness, his captor's chill, firm hand pressing the knife against Morgan's throat. Each time quiet footsteps passed their hiding place, his heart raced. Whether they were found by Sithi or Norn, Morgan did not think the discoverers would care that he belonged to neither army. The sounds of pursuit faded at last. After a long silence, he whispered, There's no one else coming. You can let me go now. I promise I won't tell anyone. His only reply was a quiet hiss. It might have been laughter, but could have been something less pleasant. The keen edge of the knife was cold against his skin. It seemed like such a small thing, that edge, thinner than a broom straw, barely more perceptible than a smear of water or a waft of cool air, yet he did not doubt it could end his life. The one who holds me is a Norn, one of the white foxes. They have no souls. They hate us and they want our kind dead. But for some unknown reason, he was still alive. The Norn put her feet into the small of his back and shoved him hard enough to send him sprawling forward onto his hands and knees. Get up, she said quietly. Slow. We go now. He considered trying to crawl away and then make a run for it, but remembered that both the Norns and Sithi could see much better in the dark than he could. He started to get to his feet and knocked his head painfully against the stone above him. Go, she said. Move. I am just behind. Go where? he asked, rubbing his aching head. Deeper into the tunnels? Again the hiss. Fool, I never have been in this place, but I still know more than you. Below this city much farther, below the river, the water comes in everywhere. Can you live without breath? 
he felt the point of a heavier blade than the knife push against his spine. We move now, she said, but quiet, do only what I say. Do all immortals speak westerling? he wondered. Is it some magic? She made him lie face down on the stone as she climbed over him to get out of the crevice. She felt surprisingly light, but moved with such swift purpose that he did not even consider trying to fight for his freedom. He followed her out into the passage and nearly walked into the point of a long, sharp sword. Do I need to say no tricks? she asked. Morgan shook his head. Now that they had left the crevice, the light from the glowing stone shone on them again, dim but steady. He could see that the woman, no, the immortal creature, he reminded himself, perhaps many centuries old, was a little shorter than he was and much more slender. Still, the sword in her death-pale hand did not waver, as though it were lighter than a birch wand. But it was the narrow oval of her face that caught his attention. Her eyes were large and tilted upward like those of the Sithi folk he had met. But this creature's eyes were not molten gold like theirs, but dark as a starless sky, a difference made even more prominent by her almost invisible cobweb eyebrows. He had never seen a Norn, and he was startled by how much she looked like a very pale-skinned mortal. Her face was narrow, but her features would not have been outlandish on one of his own kind. You stare, she said, sounding almost amused, though Morgan would not have wanted to risk his life on that. You find me horrifying, or you think me comely? He did find her comely, even with her sword only inches from his throat, but he quickly looked down. No, I just didn't know who it was that, that caught me in the dark. He lifted his eyes until he met hers, bottomless wells, inky depths. Now I see. She made a noise of derision. Move then. I do not stay here. No, cannot stay here. Soon the sacrifices will have all the city, then they make a careful search of even these deep places. Morgan was exhausted, every muscle trembling, and yet there was that unarguable sword pointed directly at him, the gray blade so slim it was almost invisible. What do you want me to do? Walk before me. Do nothing foolish. He lifted his hands in a gesture of resignation. And my own sword? To his surprise, she laughed. Wear it, if you like, but draw it against me, and you learn fast what a sacrifice knows. Sacrifice? Is that what you call yourself? The laugh again, swift and harsh. Ah, once I did, with much pride. Now I do not. Walk, mortal boy. Not a boy, he muttered, but his captor gave no sign of having heard him. The nor both, by the way, both of my, um, both of my uh, pictures of what's going out has have frozen. I assume you can all still hear me, so nobody has, and uh, because nobody has said anything about it, so I'm assuming that that's still working, and that you guys will let me know if for some reason that there's something wrong with the feed. The Norn moved so silently that Morgan kept looking back to see if she was following. Each time he found her only an arm's length or so behind him, and each time she gestured fiercely for him to keep moving. Despite her earlier words, she forced him down into Daichikiza's ancient depths, tunnels that had been shaped to a smooth finish in the upper levels, and freely carved with figures and symbols, barely touched by time, now grew more crude. The few carvings they encountered were simple constructions of straight lines, and Morgan suspected they were nothing more ambitious than direction markers. 
it would certainly have been easy to lose oneself in the maze of tunnels, which seemed just as shapeless and haphazard to him as the arrangement of the city above ground. Here, though, there were no distractions except the occasional net of roots splayed across the tunnel ceiling or clusters of mushrooms clinging to the damp walls. In some places, the palely, palely radiant stones still shone in the walls and roof, but as they descended, these pools of light became less frequent, and the tunnel floors were often clogged by debris falling from the ceiling. Several times, they had to get down on all fours and crawl through a particularly narrow spot, the Norn sword poking at the soles of his boots. They had been walking for what seemed at least an hour, and Morgan was finding it hard going. Overwhelmed by weariness and the ache in his bruised chest, each time he took a deep breath, he finally broke the silence. Where are we going? Do you know? Something jabbed him in the back of his neck, nasty and shocking as the sting of a bee. Morgan reached up to feel it. When he brought his hand down, it was smeared with blood. He turned to say something angry, but the look in his captor's night-dark eyes silenced him immediately. She lifted a finger to her mouth, but the poke in the neck and her hard stare had already made the message clear. He was not to talk. He still couldn't understand his captor's plan. He had seen with his own eyes that the ruined city of Dai Chiquiza stood beside a wide, often swift river. And after such a long time walking downward, Morgan thought the two of them must now be below it. In some places, the water seeped out of cracks in the wall and ran beside their path for a short while before disappearing down into other crevices. But otherwise, the river seemed no closer than it had been when they started. At last, his captor began to guide him upward once more through a series of sloping passages. The change from carefully excavated and finished corridors to crudely hacked tunnels now reversed itself. Intricate carvings began to appear on the walls again. They passed several caverns enlarged into storehouses, and he could even see the remains of earthenware jars in, oh, sorry. They passed several caverns enlarged into storehouses, and he could even see the remains of earthenware jars in some. Most of the vessels had long since broken into pieces. Just as the fear in his belly and the painful throb of sore muscles had driven him to a serious contemplation of throwing himself down on the ground and letting the Norn end his suffering, she poked him again, but more gently this time. They had reached a place where three tunnels came together. She slipped past him to examine the faint scratches on the wall, then pointed down one of the passages. Morgan groaned quietly, but began to walk again. At first he sensed the difference more than saw it, because the great space into which they had entered was much darker than the corridor. He stopped, befuddled by the different feeling of the air and the dying echoes. A dim light kindled above him, then another, and another, until half a dozen slabs of crystal glowed faintly in the ceiling of the wide chamber. And it was a wide chamber, though as in other parts of the tunnels, the floor was cluttered with fallen stone and broken pottery and even what looked like the rotting remains of wooden furniture. The ceiling stretched upward three times his own height and the nearest walls on the far side looked to be a long stone's throw away. One of the city's great vaults, she spoke in a whisper. Here you may rest for a while. Morgan's weariness overwhelmed any curiosity he might have felt. He staggered forward until he found a place where the stone floor was empty of jagged potsherds, then stretched out in the ancient dust. Within moments he had fallen into sleep. And then I'm going to skip over another section and continue with Morgan's part of the story. Morgan awoke to find the Norn's narrow, ghost-like face directly above his own, and her hand clamped firmly over his mouth. He struggled, but she set the tip of her knife against his cheek, just beneath his eye. Silent! 
she hissed. Hounds coming. I don't hear, he began, but a prick from her knife convinced him to close his mouth. She pointed to her nose, then toward the far side of the cavernous space she had called a great vault. She was saying that she could smell them. He climbed onto his feet as silently as he could. Hounds, he wondered, what did that mean? Another of his grandfather's stories came drifting up from his memory. A tale about young Simon being chased through the forest by huge white dogs. But Morgan couldn't remember how that story had ended, except that, obviously, his grandfather had escaped. A quick look at his captor told him that though escape might be possible, it would not be easy. Her pale features seemed an empty mask, but her posture and her drawn weapons, long knife and silvery gray sword, told him she was prepared for a deadly fight. Morgan slid Snake Splitter out of its scabbard and moved to her side, just as half a dozen or more pale, silent animal shapes burst into the high chamber from an opening at the vault's far end. As the, as the beasts sprang toward them, toothy mouths gaping, the Norn leaped to one side. For a panicky instant, Morgan thought she had deserted him, but the pack immediately split into two groups, two of the huge hounds heading toward Morgan, while the rest continued toward his Norn companion. The beasts were huge, nearly the size of ponies, their white fur so short that even in the dim light, he could see their muscles and tendons almost as clearly as if they had been skinned. They made no sound except for their panting breath. No barking, no howling, not even the click of claws on stone. The two bounding toward him each looked away at least as much as he did, so Morgan did the only thing he could do, backing up until he could clamber onto one of the fallen roof stones and gain the advantage of high ground. He had barely turned back when the first hound sprang at him from almost a dozen paces away, an astonishing leap he would never have guessed possible. Time seemed to slow to a snail's crawl. The great pink mouth opened wide like a blooming flower, yellow fangs visible to the gums. It was all Morgan could manage to get the point of his sword in front of him. His jab caught flesh, but it was only a glancing cut. The massive beast missed him by a hand's breadth. The blood from its wounded muzzle, warm as a summer rain, sprayed his head, sprayed his face as it flew past. Then the second hound attacked. This animal was more cautious than the first. Instead of jumping, it put its front paws up on the stone and, like a striking snake, darted its head at Morgan's legs. He knew he had only wounded the first hound, so he jabbed hurriedly at the second, and by lucky chance managed to plunge his blade into the creature's mouth, piercing its jaw. The white hound let out a strangled yelp and whipped its head back and forth like an eel as it tried to get free of the sword. Morgan managed to hold on to Snake Splitter, but the dog slipped over backward, and its weight tugged Morgan off his stone perch. His fall to the cavern floor knocked out his breath. The hound managed to yank the sword from his grip, but seemed more intent on getting free of the painful piece of metal in its jaw than coming after him. Still, Morgan was terrified that the other hound would attack while he was unarmed, so he grabbed the first object he could find, a jagged piece of pottery, and when the struggling second dog turned toward him, he swung the shard into the creature's eye. The pottery broke into pieces, but the dog stumbled and fell. Before it could get up again, he yanked his sword free from its jaw and thrust it as far as he could into the thing's belly. Something struck him from behind, knocking him over the hound's corpse so hard that he rolled several times. Before he had even stopped tumbling, a great weight landed on top of him, the first hound snapping at Morgan's head and neck. He rolled onto his back and punched at it, then pulled up his knees until they were against the dog's heaving midsection. He tried to push it off him, but the beast kept lunging, still eerily silent, spittle and blood flying from its muzzle. 
Morgan managed to get Snake Splitter up and flat against the dog's neck. His other hand wrapped around the blade to hold back the creature's snapping jaws. Blood from his palm ran down his wrist, but Morgan did not even feel it, not with the hound's carrion breath fouling his nostrils. The creature's weight bent the sword and kept Morgan from turning the edge of the blade toward its throat. Then, as it strained toward him, bending Snake Splitter even farther, the dog abruptly twitched, violently, shivered, and thrust its snout high in the air before collapsing on top of him. For several heartbeats, Morgan could only gasp for breath. When he tried to move the hound's body, he felt the hilt of a knife sticking out of its broad rib cage. Not safe yet! The Norn appeared beside him and freed him from the pale canine corpse. Morgan struggled to sit up. With the hound's weight gone, he felt light as a feather and not much more substantial. His limbs were trembling. What? She yanked the knife out of the dog's bloody side. Not safe yet. Morgan stared at the scatter of animal bodies on the other side of the room. One, two, three, four, and the one on top of him made five. She had killed four of the white monsters in the time it took him to kill one, and then managed to kill the sixth as it tried to bite off his face, and she was not even breathing swiftly. How did you... Did you throw that knife? Get up! He scrambled to his feet just as three more shapes ran into the storeroom. Two-legged newcomers, all of them carrying long knives and short spears. The parchment-white faces told him instantly that they must be Norns. Kadara! One of the figures cried, and all three sprinted toward Morgan and the Norn. Their speed shocked him, but the swiftness of his companion was even more astounding. In the blink of an eye, she leaped forward to meet them at the center of the great vault, her sword cocked at an angle above her head that made no sense to Morgan. She blocked one almost invisibly fast spear thrust. Then, so swiftly that Morgan could not quite make sense of it, she blocked the stab of a second attacker, then flipped his spear out of his hand and sent it clattering into the shadows along the cavern's edge. To Morgan's shame and relief, all three of the attackers now surrounded her, ignoring him completely. He considered trying to escape while they distracted each other. After all, he was the Norn's prisoner, not her ally but he could not make himself run, not least because he could not tear his attention from the spectacle unfolding before him. Morgan had watched the Sitha, Tanahaya, fighting alongside the pure only a few short hours earlier and had been amazed by her grace and facility with the blade. But the Norn, who had captured him, was something else entirely. She moved with what seemed like impossible speed, dancing through a storm of ringing blades and stabbing spearheads, leaping, ducking, kicking. Several times she used the thrust of one enemy to block an attack from another. It would have been exceptional even if they had been clumsy fighters in heavy armor, but the Norn warriors were her own kind, capable of swift and startling feats of their own. Yet every time they seemed to have her pinned down, and were trying to finish her, she slipped away like wind-blown smoke, and they were forced to defend themselves from a new angle of her attack. Morgan had not given up entirely on the idea of fleeing the struggle between two different enemies, but something beyond mere admiration for the Norn's skills was holding him. He had survived being lost in the forest, but it had not been all his own doing. Only joining the troop of Chikri forest creatures had kept him from starving. He still wanted desperately to get back to his home and family, but he had lost Tanahaya in the collapse of the roof, and now was deep beneath the earth in an unfamiliar place, surrounded by creatures who would cheerfully slaughter him. His Norn captor seemed to be his best hope now, his only hope. He raced across the room and snatched up the spear that she had knocked away from one of her attackers. 
When he turned, he saw that though one of the Norn soldiers had been down, he was not badly injured and was about to rejoin the fight. Morgan dashed forward and shoved the spear into the Norn soldier's back, even as he rose, all ideas of fairness and chivalry gone in the terror of real combat. The Norn arched in agony as Morgan yanked the spear back out, his blood gushing black in the dark vault before he tumbled forward and lay motionless. One of the other attackers was distracted by his fellow warrior's death gasp, and in that instant, Morgan's Norn captor put the tip of her slender gray blade into his eye, then snatched the spear from his suddenly strengthless hand and blocked a desperate blow at her neck from the third sacrifice soldier. A moment later, her blade passed through his stomach and tented his cloak behind him. She yanked out the gray sword with a flourish, like a courtier presenting an expensive gift. The Norn soldier slumped to the stone floor. As she cleaned her blade on her dead enemy's cloak, she looked over at Morgan, her face still preternaturally calm, as if she had not just destroyed two skilled fairy warriors and several monstrous hounds in a matter of moments. What did you say your name was, mortal? It took a moment. He was still short of breath. I don't think I did. You had a knife to my throat, remember? Her expression did not change. Your name. Morgan. He considered listing his titles, letting her know how important he was, but decided against it. Morgan of Urchester. And I've forgotten your name. Nizeru. She slid her blade back into its scabbard, still fixing him with that stony look. So, Morgan of Urchester, I will say only this. You may have thought to win my trust, but do not involve yourself in my battles again. I do not need your help. I do not want your aid. In fact, I want nothing at all from any mortal. And that's the end of that chapter. It's funny, I'm still faced with these frozen images of myself, but they froze at different times, which is even stranger. <clears throat> anyway, um, so there's a little smattering of narrow dark. I'll either read that again, or maybe I'll try to find another bit. I'm not going to go on and read this book, obviously, because it hasn't even come out yet. So, um, But I just thought it would make a nice treat for tonight while I figure what I'm going to do in the near future. Um, and before you go, let me just explain a little bit of what's been going on with Navigator's Children before I hang it up for the night, which has been a really interesting, and as I was telling Deb the other night, we were sitting out in front um, and we were just chatting about various things. And, uh, I said to her without quite thinking about it, I said, this is like the hardest book I've ever written or the most difficult process I've ever had. And it was only after I said it that I realized, you know, actually that's true. Um, I'd had a very difficult time writing to Green Angel Tower, but that was only partially because of the book itself and its hideous, huge size. Um, but mostly the problem was that with writing to Green Angel Tower was I was going through a very complicated and painful time in my life where I was uh, going through a separation and divorce and was on the uh, verge of moving to England and, you know, uh, moving away from my whole life in California and moving away from my family and everybody and friends uh, and starting off to have a new life, but mostly just because it, I was really depressed and in a lot of pain through a lot of Two Green Angel Tower. Um, amusingly enough, I was going through one of my very worst times when I got to the part where, um, spoiler alert, where Simon was held captive on the wheel, which is a very harrowing section. But the funny thing was, is I was writing, I was torturing my main character. And at a time when I was going through a lot of pain myself, and uh, 
But it was something that I already knew was going to happen. It was not like I went, oh, I'm in a miserable mood. Therefore, I'm going to be really mean and cruel to my main character. No, it just happened to coincide while I was on my own personal wheel. It's just the way things work sometimes. But anyway, so that book was pre previously the most difficult thing to write. And the other land books were very, very difficult in many ways, just because they required so much work and they did require a huge amount of work. But this book has been very complicated and very difficult because I had this huge gap in the middle because of COVID and various other things. Um, the publication of everything got pushed back. And because the publication of everything got pushed back, I actually put, I was probably a bit more than halfway through Navigator's Children um, and finishing and had had finished a first draft of, of uh, what is now Into the Narrow Dark, although at that point it was all one book. Um, and I decided to stop since I wasn't going to be able to, to see Narrow Dark or rather Navigator's Children, which was then just one, another long third volume in publication for a long time. So I went, well, this is a good time to write Brothers of the Wind because the more I think about it, the more I want to thread certain parts of Brothers of the Wind into this big trilogy. So I put Navigator's Children aside and started working on Brothers of the Wind. Somewhere in there, I realized, actually, I'm going to have to chop this into two books because we can't do a big hardcover the way we did for To Green Angel Tower, which was also hugely long and probably this would have probably been about as long, but paper was much cheaper back in those days and they had to get special paper for it and all kinds of, excuse me, all kinds of things. And basically my publishers pretty much said, we can't do that again. Um, it, we just can't, it, it, you can't even get that paper anymore. So I decided, okay, we'll split the book. I will concentrate on finishing the first volume and getting it ready or the first half um, and give it a new name and concentrate. And that, of course, wound up being Into the Narrow Dark. So I spent all my time working on Narrow Dark and getting it ready for publication. And by the time this last January or whatever that I went back to Navigator's Children, I had changed so many things in Navigator, or rather in Narrow Dark, which had been the first half of Navigator, that the second half now had all these things that were completely different, or were completely different from what the book I just finished, Narrow Dark, said. So I had to go back to Navigator's Children, which is the one I'm working on now, with all the stuff that had changed in into the narrow dark and integrate it with this half a book that I had written before, but in this very complicated way where I was having to take all these different bits and pieces from different times and try and make something sensible out of them and a new running order for certain parts and adding in bits and remembering what things were what I had planned to have happen for certain things and if they would still fit with anyway, without going into too much detail, since it's just about time to wrap up, it has turned into this incredibly complicated four, four dimensional chess game where I'm not only having to fit together all these different pieces from different times, but I'm also having to remember all the details while I'm doing it um, from several different versions of the story. Um, so it's been a really interesting challenge, and I'm not saying that as a complaint. I think it, the extra time has actually improved Navigator's Children. It has solidified a lot of ideas for me. Um, it has given me more of a chance than I usually have to see my own themes and therefore work with them in a more conscious way um, and bury some of them a little deeper so they're not so obviously, oh, there's Tad's same old themes coming up again, and various things like that. And I think I've figured out some bits and pieces and some character things that I might have figured out while finishing Navigator if it had, if I had finished it the way I was originally working on it. But certainly with that length of time to think about it, I believe I've come up with solutions that were even better. Anyway, 
So that's what's been going on. Navigator's Children is incredibly complicated, but I think it's also going to be a good book. And I think it's benefited from the extra time. I certainly hope so. And uh, with that, I want to say thank you so much. It is uh, such a, such a pleasure to have you with me. And everybody that I didn't get a chance to say hello to who showed up partway through, like Bessa, Be Be like Jessica and Becky and Volks, and Anthony, um, I want to thank you for joining me. And uh, meanwhile, um, I will be reading tomorrow night at 7. Um, I don't know what I'll be reading yet and talking. And then at some point after that, I'm probably going to start doing um, a world building thing. Um, but I'll be doing it live and um, probably wandering off onto tangents and stuff like that. So it won't be that different from the reading. And there will be reading involved too, probably. So anyway, that's my current plan. Wanted to check in with you all. Um, keep looking in on my social media stuff to find out what I'm doing. I don't know if I'll be here next week, but I will definitely be here tomorrow or today now at 7 p.m. Um, and I will definitely be coming back and doing more of this stuff. So anyway, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you so much for joining me. Be good to yourselves. Be good to your family and loved ones. Be good to your neighbors and the people around you. We are slowly, slowly making our way through both the pandemic and various other horrible things that have been going on in the world. Um, and somehow we will all struggle through together. Um, but we have to stay together to do that. So I appreciate your company and I've enjoyed sharing mine with you and I will see you again very soon. Some of you as early as 7 p.m. tonight. So, all right, peace, bye.